Hello and welcome to episode 50 of the Perth to Paisley podcast. It is insane that we've got to this point, to be honest. Me and Adam thought it would get five episodes in at most and thought we'd be like, we don't want to listen to that, we'll be done. But we've managed to make it to 50 and people actually seem interested, which is a massive positive. And to celebrate the 50th episode, halfway through this episode, we have Liam Boyce on. I had a 40-minute chat with him. Adam in the, or it's that way, Adam in the visual part of this on YouTube is wearing the Northern Irish top. So if you want to see him in that, I'm in a Scotland top. It's great, representing Craig Gordon and John Souter. We'll speak about them soon. But yeah, me and Liam had a great chat, 40 minutes. I will put the timestamp here. So if you're watching on YouTube, if you want to just skip to that, there's the time. Uh, audio listeners, I'll put it in the description if you just want to jump to that as well. Totally understandable. But on top of that, as if because the world knew we had a 50th episode, Despite me being really negative, despite Adam having a couple of predictions going with his heart in his head, Heart of Midlothian kicked off their 2021-2022 season by defeating Glasgow Celtic at Tynecastle Park, allowing Celtic to suffer defeat for the first time in both our lifetimes, which is a stat I only found out today, which is incredible. I am, as ever, going to be talking about this Myself, Daniel, with Adam. Adam, how are you doing? First of all, about 50th episode, how are you feeling? You started all this. And secondly, after the result in the weekend, how have you been? Um, the 50th episode is bonkers, um, which is, you know, it's testament to the support that we've been shown from the get-go. Um, and it's been an absolute blast. It's been a great source of therapy, actually doing this this podcast um gets a lot off your chest on a monday night that you've still got um kind of carried over from the weekend um but i don't think we'll have a lot to complain with regards to last weekend because i am still on cloud nine i'm absolutely buzzing mate genuinely that was one of the best atmospheres i've been involved in i'd say probably for the lack of numbers it probably is the best like time castle was back to its best place was absolutely electric and obviously, it's it's helped because we've managed to get three points as a result. What about you? Exactly the same. Obviously, I said that last week, uh, it was my mum's 50th birthday on Saturday. So I was down back in Gal Shields. And during the day, we made the decision, OK, I won't go back up to my flat and watch it. I'll stay down. So I got to watch it with my dad and my brother. And currently, in my lifetime, Hearts have played Celtic twice, opening day at Tynecastle. My 21st, we win 1 0. My mum's 50th, we win 2 1. Can we just schedule all heart Celtic games at Tyne Castle on important MacIver birthdays and we're going to be fine? Can I just say, I hope Mrs. MacIver had a great day. And I actually found out that that was our last win over Celtic. So it's, exactly. it's great that the streak, that's, that's what it's exactly. all about, has finally come to an end. Exactly. And it's down to the MacIver family and the MacIver family only. What can I say? But yes, you did have a great birthday. Happy birthday, Mum. But more importantly, the day was <laughs> capped off with a win. We're immediately going to get into this. However, just before that, there was one little added thing. We were going to speak about it last week, but due to the technical difficulties and all that, we kind of just forgot... And, and the fact that I forgot, never mind the technical difficulties, we can use that as an excuse all we want. I was just, it just became so apparent that, you know, the frustration was building and I didn't feel as though we were going to get an episode out. I think we just settled for, for 49 as it were. So, yes. Yeah. Um, he also hadn't officially signed by that point. So it was just a rumour. However, Hearts during the week actually made a signing. It's happened. Oh my God. Uh, it was on Friday. And quite out of nowhere in terms of the whole transfer window, but Hart signed a, a former Everton. I can, I'm going to try and say his name, right? I think I've got it. I, this is from Robert Borthwick. So if this is wrong, blame Robert Borthwick. But Benny Baningimi. Look, we'll roll with it. I'm just referring to him as Benny. It's either or that you... or Benny Bang. Yeah, I was going to say it right again. Benny Baningimi. It's one of the two. I, I feel like it's the latter, but think we'll, it is. we'll roll with it. It's Benny Boy. It's Benny. 
it's Benny. Um, yes, yeah, so we signed him from Everton. I think I just said former Everton in terms of he used to play for Everton, but we signed him from there. He kind of, I'd, I'll be honest, I'd never heard him, right? I was going to try and be like, oh, he's this type of, I'd never heard him. But after we tweeted about it, a couple of Everton fans replied to me and were saying that if it wasn't for an ankle injury he had a couple of years ago and a couple of loan spells at clubs such as Blackpool and Derby, who are not in the most secure hands right now, he would have really kicked on. But those combination of factors and the fact that Everton in the last few years have kind of had a managerial merry-go-round. Uh, David Unsworth gave him his debut as he was caretaker and David Unsworth has a lot of really good things to say about him. But when, God, I think in the time that he featured in the Everton first team and made his debut to now, Everton have about four or five managers in such a short space of time. It's hard for a young player to break through there. He's joined hearts. Before we get into his interview and obviously his impact on the park, what did you just make of the signing before he'd kicked the ball for us? Um, I, I was of the same impression as you, to be honest. I, I hadn't heard of him. I'd hold my hands up. Um, and from you know the feedback, we've talked about in the past how when a player leaves a club, the feedback from the fans when you see like these departing posts is a pretty good indication. And for the most part, it seemed as though the Evertonians were quite disappointed that he hadn't really kicked on, seemed to be a player with bags of potential, one that's been unlucky with injury, like you say, um, but something of a coup, I think, because I think most were surprised that Hearts had made the move. Obviously, I certainly was. I've got no doubts that you were surprised. Um, and yeah, it, it seemed as though finally we're kind of, we've talked about us taking our time, but now seems the time where we're sort of going in for targets, which is great. And to be honest, I mean, we'll touch on his debut later on. If that first full 90 is something to go off, then he's worth the wait, as I hope numerous other targets are. I really liked his honesty. Uh, of course, he, he gave an interview with the club and Phil was speaking to him. And I like the fact that he just went, hearts had never entered my mind. Like, I'll be honest, I was down... In Liverpool, thinking about the clubs around me and Hart and Midlothian had never entered his mind. But it was when he came up, met Robbie, met the team, saw the facilities, that that's what sold him. And I really liked that because I think in the last few years there's kind of been an element of players being like, I'm delighted to be here. And they see this as the kind of peak of their careers. And there's not, there's not anything wrong with that necessarily. I remember... A couple of people have come in and had really good careers here after saying, oh, I've, I've wanted to play for this club for so long. But there is another element, like, for example, recently, I think of Popescu. I remember Popescu's interview, he said, like, I, I never imagined playing for a club of this size. And there's almost an element of going, OK, is this, are you feeling lucky to be here? In the way of, like, I shouldn't be at this level, but I'll take it. Whereas the, the other player that really comes to my mind with Benny is Doom. Doom never hid the fact that he had higher aspirations for us than us, sorry. And I will never be bothered by that if the players perform in the park. If you do fantastically, then that just means that you're doing great for us and then you get a move and it's benefited both parties. I really like that Benny was like, I hope to kickstart my career here. Listen, if he's at the level that he's being hyped at, apparently way too good for under 23s in the Premiership, but not quite good enough to make that step up then he probably won't be at us for much length of time. He might not even see that three-year deal out. But it is it just feels like a coup in a weird way, even though we've just said we've never heard of him. But it, just with all that we're hearing and the place he's come from, it does feel like a very big signing and one that is proof of the, well, we might not have got him if we just jumped into the transfer market and picked up somebody random in that position. I think it'll be intriguing now to see whether Hearts are using these players that sort of fall through the trapdoor at your clubs like Everton as a potential destination to sell to a young player. You know, he turns 23 in September. So uh, the fact that he's younger than both of us is crazy, but views obviously Hearts as a stepping stone. He's not daft. He knows that if he can perform here, you know, there's Saturday night, for example, in front of the Sky cameras, the English season hasn't even kicked off yet. So chances are we might get that little bit extra viewership that you wouldn't normally see. 
and he's impressed. You know, it, it's daft saying that he's put, he's put himself in the shop window, but he's certainly like he's given that impression that you know what he can make an impact here. And like I say, if that's his first full ninety, he's yet to get up to full fitness. And I'm very very encouraged by what I see, and hopefully, you know, his performances can be he can be a consistent performer for us, and then the reward may come with that move later on down the line. 100%. And we will get in to the game that he did make his probably surprise debut, just in account of how little he's played. He only trained with the team. However, last week, me and Adam gave our team what the team we'd play. We gave identical teams. And it was that identical team barring one player. Uh, so it was Craig Gordon and goals in the 3-4-3. Kingsley, Halkett and Suter with wing-backs of Cochrane and Smith. Halliday and Benny instead of Herring, who dropped out, and then Janelli, GMS, and Boyce. How did you feel that he was just immediately being dropped in and that Herring was the one that dropped out? I thought it was a very bold move. Um, it was certainly one that I think was met with kind of unanimous surprise. Um, but obviously, hindsight's a, a wonderful thing. I don't think had he performed anywhere near as well as he did, then I think the torches would have been out. In, in all honesty, um, I was somewhat surprised that Big Pete was the one that was kind of the sacrificial lamb in the end. I think I think with Andy Halliday, you're always going to get him up for this game. Mm -hmm. So whether that's perhaps played into Robbie's mind, plus the fact that, I mean, I said it numerous times last season, he signed Halliday. So obviously he rates him. And there was times last season where we both said, you know, Perhaps Halliday's worth dropping, but then I thought that because Robbie had signed him, he's sticking by his man and whatnot. Um, but I don't think we can fault either of the midfield performances, even Big Pete when he came on, to be honest. And we'll touch on that later on. I wasn't particularly pleased with the substitution at the time, but in the end, you could say that Robbie, from the starting eleven that he's picked and the tactics that, you know, the tactics and the game plan that came later on, you could argue that he's got it spot on to an extent. Well, that spot on tactic started pretty immediately as in the opening kind of six minutes, it was quite back and forward. Celtic had a chance where Soapy slipped uh, and they got in, but Turnbull kind of flashes it over the bar. But then pretty quickly after that, Suter picks up the ball, plays it inside to Benny, who it's quite a slack pass, but he manages to get it back, plays it to Smith, who gives it back inside to Suter, who plays a fantastic ball up to Janelli, who... I think actually had a very good game in general in terms of obviously this moment, but just generally up against Greg Taylor, which I said last week, I really bet on him against that. I was thinking there's only one winner in my mind and it was kind of be proven to be true. Janelli takes it and the brand new uh, star felt for Celtic multi-million pound defender also kind of surprisingly making his debut. I think it was more a level of Postacoglu was like, I just need, I can't play the same defense I've played the last couple of games. Let's just chuck Starfield in in the exact same way probably Robbie was thinking about Benny. Just baptism of fire, he might do really well. He didn't do really well as he Janelli gets past him. Wee bit of luck where kind of ricochet plays it back across to Boyce, who just does incredibly, incredibly well to hold off the defenders. Starfelt then does a weird kind of 280 slide challenge to try and get it. Boyce. I'm not sure if he means to pass it or shoot, but he gets it across and Guy and Kai Steven is just there for... I was about to say a tap and he couldn't miss, but we've seen that he can miss a chance for that distance. But you can't ask for a better start. No, and, and this was the kind of main thing for me. I, I know that, you know, there is an element of luck in both goals um, and the performance on the whole but it was imperative that we got off to a flying start. You know, everybody in the media has talked about this Celtic back four. Like you say, I think I agree with you. And I think Postacoglu was that desperate for a centre-half. He has chucked Starfield in from the get-go. I mean, their other centre-half is near beat on. Yeah, He's a midfield yeah. player. You know, and then other than that, you're looking at young young guys like Stephen Welsh and yeah. is it Dane Murray, the other boy? Yes, so, it is, yeah. So... He's gone with established pros, albeit one of them is not a centre half. Anthony Ralston, Greg Taylor, like it looked like a quartet of like football manager regens. So we absolutely had to get off to a flying start, get the crowd, you know, up for it. And it showed that we were up for it. Um, 
with regards to the goal, I, I thought the chance had gone, to be perfectly honest, with, with Boise. I'm not going to lie. I know, I know it's great to have him on the podcast, but <laughs> thankfully I wasn't there face to face so I could slow him. But no, um, I, I thought it had gone. And Gary Mackay, Stephen, right place, right time. Simplest of finishes in the end. Um, and it's two play- well, arguably all three players, that front three, who are going to be so imperative for us um, that link up for the goal alongside Suter and Michael Smith, who were both outstanding again. So, yeah, my, my player of the year shout actually looked <laughs> like it was off to a great start after 10 minutes of the competitive season. Or 10 minutes of the premiership season, I should say. Very true. Um, I'd, I want to mention something about that goal because, obviously, listen, we've heard and we've mentioned there about the defensive frailties that Celtic have had in this off-season. And obviously, they haven't had the Premier Sports Cup, but they've been playing in Champions League qualifiers where they did lose out to Michelin. I, I'll be honest, though, I hadn't seen it. I hadn't seen any of it apart from Antonio's goal on Twitter where I saw clips of it. So I, I didn't know if... Celtic's defensive problems were that on a whole they were fragile or they were just suspect to moments. That game proved it was both because the moment is that goal because when you freeze frame it on Boyce having the ball at his feet, Tony Ralston, who will get to, is complete, in my opinion, is the most at fault for that goal because it's like something we do against Celtic. Tony Ralston's meant to be the right back where Cochrane and GMS are coming in, but he just ball watches completely. So just runs towards the ball, despite Beaton and Starfelt both being right there. Which means and everybody that, queuing up at the back stick for us. Exactly. And he's playing them all on side. So when you freeze frame it, there's six Hearts players in the box. There's Gino, who's just played the ball across. Boyce GMS and then there's Smith oh no there's seven then there's Smith <laughs> Halliday GMS and Cochrane almost in a lateral line just going if you miss it I'll take it and I, gen- I can't remember seeing a Celtic team have a moment like that like often if we score against Celtic it's either from a set piece like we did later or just like a bit of brilliance and you go Celtic can kind of look at it and go I don't know if we could have done much about that. Like, for example, we go back to my 21st in 2018. Uche just kind of steamrolls through and then it's a fantastic finish by Lafferty. And there is an element of, well, that's just a great goal. Whereas the goal that Guy McKay Stevens scored is so avoidable. And I kind of felt that was the story for the whole game. I just felt that if, watching that game, I was like, if we push them, we'll score. There was a kind of collection of individual errors, wasn't there? They're sort of at sixes and sevens. And mm. like you say, I mean, it was just vital that we took advantage of that fully. I, I really like the shape in terms of us, mm. you know, up. A, I don't know whether them opting for a 4 2 3 1 suited us in terms of getting numbers yeah. forward. But certainly, you know, there's an argument to be had that we looked menacing, just as we arguably did in the, in the Premier Sports Cup group as well. So the fact that we've taken that from victories over Cove Rangers, Stalling Albion, whoever else, to up against Celtic um, is, is fantastic. And it's probably a testament to, you know, the work on the training ground and us implementing a genuine game plan that makes us look, yeah, like like we're on the front foot. And that's, that's all we really ask for, particularly in big clashes like this. Well, to... Whilst I agree with you to completely go against your point, I. This is the thing, right? I'm going to get pelts for this. I thought like Saturday was amazing. I don't think we won that game as a result of tactics, though. I think. Oh no. Won, yeah, I think we won that game from individual brilliance that we'll get to later. But it starts now, so we score really early, arguably earlier than we probably expected to score. Definitely. And what that meant was, was that we just started sitting in and sitting deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, I will say this, because I've been sick and tired over the weekend seeing Celtic fans quote the possession stats and going, oh, look at this. We had seven, BBC's reporting at 74%, other places are reporting at 78%. Just reminding me of last season. 
Yeah, exactly. So it's like, so therefore it was completely ridiculous that we lost. Look, we absolutely dominated you. There is such a difference in Celtic covering 74% in seasons gone by where they are constantly pressuring us, constantly throwing everything at us, playing free flow and attacking football, and you just feel we're just going to get battered here. The reason they had 74% possession is because we win, have all the ball you want in your half. We don't care. You're not going to do anything from it. You can also kind of have it in the first quarter or kind of the first third of our half as well. As soon as they took a step into the kind of remaining two thirds of our goal and that extra middle bit, we then pressured and they had to go backwards. So yeah, well done. You had 74% possession. It means nothing if you do nothing with it. Like for the majority of that game, we limited them to long range shots, which Gordon was happy to deal with all day, or they were trying to get into positions and had to turn around and go backwards. I felt as though their final ball probably let them down. Mm -hmm. And I think that's testament to our defensive unit, the shape that we held. Um, Of course, there's a bit of luck. But like you say, I think... I think we ought to give ourselves a bit credit for what was a solid defensive performance, probably more so in the first half. Mm -hmm. I think, like you say, there was a couple long-range shots. Edward has a header from a corner, which, you know, is straight down Craig Gordon's throat. But other than that, I did feel as though we nullified their threat pretty well. You know, I'm a big fan of David Turnbull's. I thought he was non-existent. Yeah. Uh, You could argue that the change, Ryan Christie coming on for him, I think he did, um, should have came earlier, earlier on. Um, but you know, it wasn't a, a classic Hearts performance. But in, in that we are sort of applying pressure to them, but it was a backs to the wall, gritty sort of see out performance that you would expect from Hearts. Probably in the latter stages of a game, if we've taken the lead, the frustration then arises. Well, we've gone one nil up, and then we sit back, like you say, but. First half, we coped with it and we rolled it out till half time. Well, we then do get into the second half and we just sat deeper and deeper and deeper. And then Tony Ralston, the man who I blame for uh, them conceding our first goal, just turns into a number 10 for no reason. I don't know what he's doing. I will say, I kind of disagree with you when you said that um, our midfield had faultless performances. I didn't think Halliday was all that great. Um, I thought the things he had to do, he did them very well. The stuff that you expect Howard to do. I was, it was one of the few games, actually, I thought, you've actually done what you had to do. Often you hear about Andy Howard and it's just like, he's a wee pit bull. You put him in and just go, just tackle players, keep on your mind, stuff like that. And rarely, especially last season, did I ever felt he actually did that. So I was like, what are you offering? I felt he did that. Uh, on Saturday night. Obviously, the big one is the McGregor challenge, which is a red. The best thing about it is that Haldi gets up and is incredulous and is like, I got the ball. It's like you couldn't be further away from the ball. So, obviously, again, conspiracy, Celtic fans are raging about that. Can I just say I disagree? I think the best thing about that is the fact that he escapes a booking, never mind a red card. Yeah. Do, Do you want to know, I don't know if you saw this, This was the first game between Hearts and Celtic in 57 clashes that Hearts haven't received a yellow card. Bloody hell, 57 games. Coincidentally, it's the first game without Celtic fans. Jesus. A mental stat. 57 games? Yeah. I mean, it's not that hard to believe, considering... No, of course, given the, you know, the animosity and the fact that it's probably... I think I dubbed it one of Scottish football's feistiest fixtures, but... Yeah. That is mental. Yeah, it's insane. But yeah, so that's a cool thing. But I blame Halliday for their goal because he absolutely shits it out of challenge. In the middle of... I think it's Edward. I might be wrong. But the ball gets fed right beside him and he just kind of pulls out a challenge completely and that allows Ralston to just pick it up. And then, obviously, Ralston still has to beat a few players. But I was going to say, he's still got a lot to do, mate. 100%. But that's the moments where I'm like, how do you should just be hitting him? Like, yeah, give away a foul, like, but that's all you do. Like, you're the guy who breaks up play. So I just felt... I, I was... 
I'm not going to criticise really anybody on that park, right? This isn't a game for criticising. It's just I worry a wee bit because personally, I would have dropped Halliday for Benny and played Herring and Benny. And I can understand when people go, they're very similar players. But I kind of see Halliday's been quite a similar player. And when Herring came on, I felt that exemplified it because all three of them played very similar roles and they all played them really well. But it was quite a similar role. They, they were all very combative is probably yes. the word I'd use. Yes. You know, we, ultimately it's to frustrate. And I don't know whether we're looking at it as soon as Ralston equalises and we're settling for a point. I, th- I think we'd be as well talking about this now, but the substitutions at yeah. the time from Robbie really irked me. You know, he takes off GMS. I think GMS came off for Haring. Was that the first one? Yeah, that, that was the big one that set Twitter alight. And and set me alight in the stands mm-hmm. with a couple of my pals. You know, it's like, I just felt as though, we even touched on it, you know, last week. And you mentioned it earlier. The threat was the wide areas. GMS up against Ralston, Janelli up against Taylor. And then you've essentially lost, you know, half that threat or the chance to, is it then solely down the right? But even then, Janelli looked as though he was playing up with Boyce. Yeah, he it was. He moved, me, in, he moved into a two with Boyce. He moved into a central area. So then yeah. I'm thinking, does it then go to Liam Boyce to, you know, search for Janelli as a runner in behind? Is that solely the game plan and it's backs to the wall, just try and hit them on the counter with Janelli in behind? Um, and then he takes him off and brings Big Nando on. And then I'm thinking, right, okay, so it probably goes from, let's be frank, it was a five at the back, but in, offensively, then it goes to a three with kind of Boyce and Nando up front, but nobody in that <laughs> 10 area, nobody to pick up, you know, like the loose balls or seconds, none of that. So I don't know, it just, it's look, it seemed desperate when, when he took the wingers off, but ultimately Big Pete's the one that wins the foul and... I, I can see why, because essentially we regained much more possession. I, which... say, I don't think anybody disagreed with Herring coming on. It was more just no. the GMS coming off. Yeah, and I think everybody would have probably expected Benny, for how brilliant he was, to probably be the one sacrificed. You know, the fact that he hadn't played in however long... I think I saw it was his first full game since March. Yeah. He's only had that training session. Like you say, I thought that that was the change. Um But again, it's like last week. That's now two weeks on the trot where Robbie's made a change that I have not agreed with and it's paid dividends. So it's just as well that he's in the dugout as opposed to me. That is the thing because up until... So that was around the 70th minute. And then from the 70th minute onwards, we were the better side. We started to just come out a wee bit more, started to play with not freedom, but just started going for it. I thought Nandwey did really well when he came on because, and I've, I've said it, since Nandoli came here. I don't care how many goals he gets this season. I don't care. All I care about is that he comes on and opposition defenders go, shit, we need to potentially double up or at least really focus on him. And then that drags someone away from another attacking player. And it was a bit funny. It's obvious. But Robbie clearly just went, Greg Taylor's tiny go and stand near Greg Taylor. And Nandwele came on, his first involvement nearly led to a goal as a Cochrane cross. I thought it went far too far, but Nandwele managed to... Oh, that's right, yeah. Perfectly. I, th- I can't remember if Bain punches it or if Beaton gets rid of it, but then Suter runs in and hits it. I think it's it. Starfelt, actually, that nods but- it away. That would make Thanks. sense that it's the one I didn't mention. <laughs> <laughs> Suter gets a head on it, a really good attacking header. It it was the moment where I went, we need to just start shooting at Scott Bain. Everybody's been going, what a save by Scott Bain. He gets all the way across. He should be catching that. I'm sorry. He should he gets fully across. His knees almost hit the post. He's so perfectly cushioned to be able to grab it, but he has no confidence. Scott Bain is not Celtic level, right? He's not our level. He's not Dundee's level, right? He's awful. He palms it away. And then, as you said, I want Suter to get... Suter was my man in the match, personally. He was, he was fucking exceptional from start to finish, barring the actual finish, <laughs> but we'll get to that. Um, there's, it just... Starts getting played about a bit more. We're constantly attacking. And then 88th minute, I can't remember who loses the ball, but someone loses the ball. 
And Celtic look to break, and Suter makes a huge crunch and challenge on Edward, perfectly wins the ball back, plays it off. It's immediately lost, and McGregor goes to play it through, and Suter is lying on his stomach, gets Unreal. up and heads it to Herring, who then, of course, wins the foul from Soro. At that moment, it's the 89th minute, me and my dad, and I'll give my dad credit for this, my dad just went, just put the ball on Scott Bain. Just aim for Scott Bain with that ball and he'll shit himself. And it was as we were saying this going, I think Suter's been man of the match. And my dad was like, oh, 100%, he's been the best player. And then I was actually saying, but we've not put in a good delivery for a set piece yet. Michael Smith, who I thought was good. I actually thought Cochrane was better out of the two of them. I, I thought he was very solid. It was more about what we spoke last week where Smith was definitely better going forward, but Cochrane very rarely let his man go past him. I think a couple of times he could have been tighter, definitely, but he was, especially he in the last 10 minutes, he was solid. He also flashed one wide in that first half. He did. Cochrane, he did. didn't he? Where, he? where he goes in at the back stick, and I think it is a ball from Michael Smith where he's yeah. kind of look at he dinks it toward the back post in search of GMS. And that Cochrane chance, I was like, it's one of them where I'm like, anybody else is probably yeah, a goal, but yeah, I can't fault him for being, in, for being in that position. And ultimately, then it's a case of thinking, I really hope that doesn't come back to yeah, bite us. 100%. But, Obviously, it didn't. Smith puts a ball in. John Suter makes a, like, has a header. And like, it's a good header. It's a professional footballer's header, but it's right in the middle of the goal. And oh. as it makes connection with his head, I look and Scott Bain is in the fucking shadow realm. Like he is just in complete no man's land. It's a mix probably of Bain going, I have no confidence in this defence. I need to come and clear it. And then as soon as the ball gets played in, he's realised I have misjudged this completely. If he stays on his line, he doesn't need to move. He just goes and catches that ball but he doesn't and the Sky commentary said it if there is any man that deserves that moment it is John Souter after not only his performance tonight eh, on Saturday night not only his performance since coming back into the team keeping those 11 clean sheets but just the horrible horrible time he's had from injuries from a player of any age but never mind someone that young and so talented He's j- I was so, do- it was almost emotional. He himself almost got emotional. Like he said that afterwards, he said that especially when he saw fans and like had fans there, he found it quite emotional. What what did you do? Because it was bedlam in the MacIver living room. I sprinted down from the top of the Wheatfield stand and was on top of the barrier. <laughs> Honest to God, I've never celebrated a goal like that for a long, long time. Amazing. That was genuinely chaos. It was just limbs. It was just fantastic. Honestly, it just oh, all the. I think back to like last season, all that pain, all those dire streams we've had to fork out for. That's for Aloha away in the cup, Brora Rangers in the cup, the defeats to Wraith Rovers at home, Queen of the South at home. All that pain of last season, how dire, how dull, how boring it was to watch was just swept aside by that sole goal in that moment. And it was just crazy. And like you say, tiny erupted. It's like so good to see it just, it, it, it felt like 20,000. It really did. It's testament to everybody that was there on Saturday, made such a fantastic atmosphere. And it's got me encouraged for when, you know, that capacity will quadruple just how loud Tyne Castle can be we're back in the top tier. We've got big clashes to come aplenty. Hopefully it's, you know, full houses back from here on in and it'll just be fantastic. It's what we've been missing. It's what we've been craving. And it felt like Hearts were genuinely back. Well, it was almost ruined right at the very end <laughs> as in the 93rd minute, I think, technically, Celtic got thrown. in. They play a ball. Herring does so well. He just does exactly what you want a holding midfielder to do. Christie goes to turn and try and drive forward. Herring shows him inside. He doesn't show him the byline. And Herring's like, I've done my job. 
everybody behind me will do theirs. No. <laughs> he, Christy manages to get a bottle of Edward. Forrest dummies it. It goes through to Edward. Souter and Smith are completely flat-footed. And oh, they've all, taken out the game. It's a, it's a lovely attacking move from Celtic, yeah. and it's probably one of their best in the 90. 100%. Um, but what a save from CG. So Forrest goes Whoa. through, and I as soon as the ball went past, I just resigned myself. I was like, it's 2-0. We've, we've thrown this. So undeserved. And then Gordon gets a hand to it and has a Chiellini-esque. Just what that was in that moment where Gordon celebrates as if he scored is all the talk from Celtic fans saying you weren't good enough to be here. You don't fit into our plans. Yes, thank you for everything, but we need to do, we can do better than you. But listen, take an 80% pay cut to be third choice. That, that moment was vindication for him going, he took a risk. Listen, he could have just sat on that bench, got easy money and probably then retired at the end of that contract. But he took a risk, came back to his club and managed to not only have a big moment, but a big moment at the expense of the club that basically showed him no respect and told him to fuck off. It's it's the stuff of novels, and it's a massive get it right round you to every single Celtic fan that doubted him. I see talk of, you know, oh, it's blunder after blunder, particularly on the European stage. He wasn't all that good with his feet. I don't care. Like, I know that everybody's a big advocate in the modern game for kind of playing out from the back. <laughs> My, my pal Ryan, who's a big Celtic fan, said it. He didn't want to go all Celtic da, but he said a goalkeeper's there to save shots. And I, it's so blindingly obvious to say, but it's, he's bang on the money. I couldn't care less what he does with his feet. And it's a massive coup for us to have him back. I think everybody, any remaining Craig Gordon doubters were firmly put to bed come Saturday night. That performance, you know, we could talk about the suitor winner. We could talk about us looking menacing first half, that three points, that's the difference between a victory and a draw to start off the season for me, w- without a shadow of a doubt. He then, three seconds later from the ensuing corner, as everybody's still celebrating the moment, he, a ball is played in and Starfelt, who is massively at the fault for our first, almost becomes the hero. But Gordon, Gordon makes quite, for Craig Gordon, a routine save, right? And generally, you would just be like, that's a good save, well done. But it's because of the emotion and the fact that it's just after that, fans yeah, celebrated well, that done. one as much as the other one. That was just like, <laughs> fans were trying to read the pitch and hug him. It was just amazing. He won us that game, much like Suter did. They gave us some for free. And then spent five million on somebody with hands and had Scott Bain as the replacement. It is it's mad. It really is mad. I've got to say, I, I felt as though that Starfelt save was one for the cameras, but hey, when yeah. you just pulled off that forest save, why not? I'd <laughs> Who do exactly gives a fuck? Like, exactly. exactly. I'm surprised you're not mentioned more about the winner because Scott Bain's at fault. But again, like Zonal marking, man. I mean, yeah. get that, get that in the bin. You know, I, I, you mentioned kind of the whole conspiracy theory lines and what have you. The the amount of refereeing decisions that they are, you know, ruining. End of the day, they should clear a set piece. You've got Suter there who eventually wins the header. You've got Kingsley behind him. You've got Haring behind him. There's three Hearts players in a row, all begging for, like you say, a, a decent delivery, which it is from Michael Smith that could all potentially head home. You know, con- do your job. I don't mean to go full Roy Keane, but concentrate. And then from there, you could potentially counter, because let's be frank, there were numerous times in the second half where Celtic looked as though they were going to counter mm-hmm. and score. Um, and the fact that we've nicked a last-minute winner, how many times have we seen it against them or against Rangers mm-hmm. with the old firm? You know, we... we perform well, and they just go up and nick one. I think back, I thought after the game of the Edward winner, you know, Neil Lennon's first game back as Celtic gaffer at Tynecastle. Um, 
and it just felt as though that was it was it was pleasing to see from that perspective from obviously the cup final that still you know kills me um and yeah it's just so pleasing to actually be on the right side of a last minute winner against the old firm for once well that was it unbelievably Hearts start their campaign with three points against Celtic. Before we move on, there is one guy we need to speak about because he's been the guy on everybody's lips in the last 48 hours. He just did an interview with Barry Anderson, who, before I ask you about have you read the interview with Barry Anderson? I might have. I can't remember. I don't so, think so. <laughs> I don't ben, think so, actually. So Benny made his debut, somehow lasted the full 90. So, no, I did see this. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go on. So for those who haven't read it, Benny was asked about his experience and he said that he was shaken on the pitch because he couldn't believe the atmosphere from 5,000 fans. He said that, I don't know, but maybe I'm just suited to Scottish football because he said he's never felt an atmosphere like that. Uh, and he's played against Man City, Chelsea, Leon played for Everton, obviously, but he said he's felt nothing like he did. I will give my thoughts after, but I want to hear from you first. How would you assess his full night, first 90 minutes in the heart shirt? Impeccable. Impeccable because of the supposed rustiness to be thrown into a game of that magnitude. I, I, I honestly thought it was incredible. Um, and for a guy so young, it just seems, uh, we touched on it earlier, but it genuinely does feel like a coup. And I know that that's the most harsh thing to get excited after one 90-minute performance. And I'm the first to say, you know, let's just rein it in. Let's, you know, carry that little bit of scepticism still. But it is, I mean, that's just a superb start. It's, it's literally, he said it himself, he feels like it's a dream come true for him to be here. That 90 minutes felt like a dream come true to have such a combative, again, that use of the word midfielder in the middle of the park, instrumental in breaking up everything. And that's a night that he and many of us will not forget for a long time to come. Well, this is where I come in and have the full anger of the entire support rain down on me. Um, oh, no, go. I'm not going to say that he had a bad game because of course he didn't look at him. Um, I think on the ball... He looks fantastic. Like, I don't think he lost it from when he had it. Like, whenever he got the ball, his pass accuracy was unbelievable. Some of the challenges he made were, like, picture perfect. Like, ones that you'd just go, oh, if you could draw a challenge for a CDM to make, it would be that. And he made about four or five of them, especially in that second half. And I thought, in particular, his second half was flawless almost. Like, he was just fantastic. I just have one worry, but it's almost not his fault. It's because it's kind of what I imagine Celtic fans will be staying about Starfelt. I felt, I think I counted eight times in the first half where he was caught ball watching and McGregor spinned him. He spinned him eight times. Now, obviously, it didn't lead to anything, thankfully. That was a bit of a worry for me. There was times where I thought, Oh, just focus more on your man instead of the ball, and he was a wee bit all over the place. But that comes from the fact that he doesn't know the system. He's literally had a training session, and he's in one of the biggest games we'll have all season. So that I can forgive. Like I'm going to be like, if that's the criticism I have, you've had an incredible debut. Um, my dad is not as kind as me. My dad, was, um, my dad thinks it was a kind of tale of two halves where he thought he was very poor in the first half and a lot better in the second. I think on the ball, he looks almost the best midfielder we have in terms of that, like, three. Like, hearing, I think, can, can, hearing, I think can control a game better. And we saw that when hearing came on. It was like, hearing's on, and now we just feel settled, and he can do that. But Do you think that's down to Haring's physical presence? Sorry, potentially. You no, you're, you're spot on. It added a bit of hype because Benny and Howdy are both a bit weir. And I think he's still got, you know, it, it, it's a case of adaptability for me. He's a young boy. He's still got a lot to learn. 
Um, and I know that he'll, you know, have taken a, a bundle of experience out of that Everton Academy. But ultimately, I mean, folks say it all the time. You, you learn more in competitive fixtures than you would, you know, in your standard training matches, under 23 games. So it, it is, it's a great start. And hopefully that's just the first of many a learning curve to come. 100%. I really don't want people thinking that I'm um, criticizing. I thought he had a very good game. And if if that's the kind of performance you can have after a couple of days of training and not knowing the team, then we genuinely could be in for something really special. But it was overall a very special night. And that is the perfect segue to go into a very special chat because we will now play uh, the Liam Boyce interview with me. Please know this was recorded on Friday at lunchtime. So this took place before the Celtic game. So please don't tweet us going, why didn't you ask him about his involvement in the game or anything like that? We do speak about that game and what he will expect from it. It's quite interesting to know now what happened and what he says about it. But yeah, we hope you enjoy. Thank you to Liam Boyce. Here you go. So yes, after what we just were speaking about there, it's our 50th episode. We decided we need to get somebody big. So we went with a Northern Irish international top goal scorer last season and someone who's kind of okay at a war zone, but that can be improved. It's all right. Liam Boyce is here. Liam, thank you so much for joining us. No, no problem. Thanks for having me. No, it's all right. We really do appreciate it. We wanted this 50th episode, somebody special, and so many people were like, get Boyce on if you can, get Boyce. So hopefully people are now happy that you're here. Yeah, I hope so. Hopefully I'm good. It's good fun. Definitely. Fun so <laughs> we've got loads of, it's a mix of questions from people on Twitter. I don't know if you've seen any of them. And then also I've just got a bunch of stuff. So really just casual chat. And then yeah. hopefully you don't hate it and you'll want to come back on. Yeah, of course. Right, cool. So we'll go back to the start kind of thing. January 2020, you come in. And a lot of questions were about this. The first one, Connor Preston asked it. However, we've got loads of people coming in. When did you initially hear about the transfer and how did you feel about it when you first heard? Was it immediately like, yep, I want to come back to Scotland to play for Hearts? Or were you a bit more like, oh, okay, that's an interesting offer? Well, first I heard from Hearts, they tried to the send me a couple of times, even when I was at Ross County and stuff. So I knew that was probably like a big factor that they were always interested in me. But uh, I was, was at Burton. And I think it was like just after Christmas I found out like I wasn't getting a new deal. And then so I could have just waited till the end of the season and like left them free. But just like a couple of teams wanted to try and save me. And then once like Hearts tried to save me and I knew they'd shown interest before. And obviously I've played in Scotland before. And just like how good a city Edinburgh and stuff is. And how big a club Hearts were. And Again, like how must have wanted me. It was sort of like the move I wanted to make, and like as well, like in football, like your family's moving about a lot, and like my daughter's at the age where she's going, she, she's going to school actually in a couple of weeks, and I just wanted somewhere where like they really wanted me and they wanted to keep me out for a long time, just so a bit of stability. So like when my daughter goes to school, she doesn't have to leave after one year, doesn't have to leave after six months, and. Like people don't think about the stuff you have to worry about like that, but yeah. just once that happened and like they showed faith in me and like obviously offered me a three and a half year deal, like it was like absolutely buzzing just to have that stability behind my family as well and just to show that they wanted me and I've, any team I've been at, like if they wanted me to stay, like I was more than happy to. Like even when we went to the championship, the first thing the gaffer came in was like, I wanted you to stay and it was like it's perfect for me as long as I'm wanted, I'll I'll be happy. That's brilliant. You actually said something there that perfectly leads on to the next question, which is actually from my dad, Graham, who was saying that, was it a surprise for you or potentially any other players that you've spoken to in the dressing room, just how big a club hearts actually are? Because obviously you came to Etown Castle regularly with Ross yes. County and you'd played against us, but in terms of the support base, the facilities, the kind of expectation that may be quite harsh at times, um, mm -hmm. it's such a big club, but did you were you fully aware of that, or did you kind of have an idea? Yeah, this is this is a pretty big club. No, like to be honest, I didn't. Like it's like way above my like expectations before I joined. Because like when you come, like when I came in Ross County, 
like you just when you're playing football you just sort of turn up to like obviously it's a bit you know the stadium's big but like when the fans are in and it's the our team's fans you sort of don't pay attention to how many of them there is and like I never really knew there was like 19, 20,000 coming to all games and stuff like you just don't recognise that thing that sort of thing when you're playing and then when I first signed and came like obviously like on your social media and all it goes mental and stuff but then when we played the Rangers game obviously that's even like a massive game as well but just like the noise of that game and like obviously scoring a goal in here and like the celebrations and stuff. Yeah, it was just like blew all my expectations out of the water. Like I just didn't realise. I knew they were a massive club and like but I just didn't know how big the fan base was. And that well, I knew they were big, but I didn't they weren't they were way bigger than I expected it to be. Was there any nerves when it came to that when you can you say there your social media starts blowing up? Do you kind of start going, oh, All right, okay, this is a step up, or were you just like was that actually motivation for you that you were at? kind of this nerve no, like level. when I came it was like just sort of so fast that like I didn't even have time to realise because like I came up I think it was the day before yeah and then I, I don't know I don't think I got trained I think I came like in the afternoon when they were just done training all the rest of the boys and then I just like signed and done the pictures and then I wasn't expecting to be starting so like I sort of get in and I'll get to watch the first half or probably get the last 20 minutes but and then obviously Daniel started me and I couldn't have went any better. It's just like one of them things, like the adrenaline's flowing and it's like a bit of a whirlwind. You just try and do anything you can and thankfully it worked out well at the... Well, that's it's almost as if you've seen my notes because then that perfectly also leads on to your debut. <laughs> there was kind of news that oh, you'd played a lot of games up until that point in the season with Burton and as you say, literally the day before, I don't think many people expected you to start. Not only do you start... You get an assist for Naismith and then your goal. I vividly remember you kind of just holding your leg and not being able to move very much and then just out of nowhere you hit it. What? How did that feel? I know you've spoken there about like the kind of noise that happened. Yeah. Paired with the pain that you were in, what was that moment like? Yeah, that's like the part. You couldn't, I couldn't have rolled it any better. Like Obviously, we went 1-0 down and they had a couple of chances, I think. Like from like sort of counter attacks when we were trying to put pressure on, and I think it was because like in England you play like Saturday, Tuesday, and I was playing every single game. And when I come up and I hadn't trained, I don't think I wasn't allowed to train actually like two days before I came, right? In case like you get hurt or mm-hmm. and like it like sort of jeopardizes it. But then when I came, so I hadn't trained in like two or three days, and it's like a long obviously it's like hand way high intense in Scotland and like at any game but even against Rangers it's even more and when you're one nil down you need to like work a bit harder and I think it was sort of my hamstrings were like just getting tight it wasn't like proper hurt it was just I think if I would have sprinted fully I probably would have put my hamstring or something yeah. but I think that helped me for the goal because I, I switched it out I think it was the bossy yeah and then I couldn't make the box so it was like <laughs> At the back post, like at the edge of the box, and it was like a miss hit clearance. And then once it came to me, I, I don't know why I chopped onto my left foot because I'm right footed, so you know, it just worked out perfectly. I'm in the corner, but the noise after it, I think I've even seen after like the is the Hearts TV, like the commentators. Yeah, I've seen that a couple of times. It's classic, even their their like commentary and stuff. So even when I watch it now, it's still like unreal just to like see the roar. And obviously, for it being that long from having fans, it's like. You sort of like every time I see it, you realize what you're missing even more. Yeah, I remember that because Laurie, who is the commentator, goes, What a f-, and goes yeah. to see what a fucking hit, and it just is like, <laughs> Wah! and just makes a load of noise. I think everybody was like that though. Um, obviously, the rest of the end of that season didn't exactly go to plan as yeah. it that game did. Uh, there was some highlights, obviously the Easter Road Derby where we won 3 1. However, generally, the results just didn't go the way they wanted. What was the kind of squad reaction to the news that the demotion was happening out of our hands? It wasn't that you were in control of it. It was that, all right, okay, we're, we're going to just have to deal with this. I think, like, it's like straight away, it's obviously disappointment because like, you still, no matter how bad it is, if you still have a chance, you think you can still do it. But I think for, like, for me personally, anyway, it was like, it was sort of like that Samaritan game was end up like, Sort of like a final because if we had won, we'd have yeah. been second and bottom and we'd been safe. So it like it was a bit hard to take in that way. No one like sort of made that game even worse. Like looking back, you no know, like obviously we didn't play well in that game. We got beat one 0 but 
like if you know that's going, yeah, there's no way of knowing that that was going to be the last game, but it just makes it worse that we didn't play well that night. And that could, obviously it's not the difference over the whole season, but that could have made a big difference yeah. in the outcome of it ending early. Like for me personally, that was like the hardest thing to take. That like that how bad we were that night. If we were anyway half decent, we could have like got ourselves out of a very bad situation. One hundred percent. Well, obviously we then did move into after quite a long summer that okay we're in the championship and of course Daniel Stendhal leaves Robbie Nielsen comes in you just said there at the start of this that Robbie immediately said to you you want to stick around I think there was kind of that worry amongst the fan base of who's going to be leaving who's going to be staying and of course your impact that you had you were the first name of many people's kind of minds going I really hope he stays was Robbie just like that with everybody? Was it very much like a clear plan? Like, this is what we're going to do this season. I want you guys. Or was it more like, okay, we know the situation we're in. We just need to deal with it and get forward. Yeah, like, I think he, I obviously knew the people players. Like, every manager comes in and knows what players they want to keep and stuff. And, like, from a player's point of view, if, like, don't, like I haven't been part of it. Like, at Burton, it was, like, we got relegated and, like, a lot of players left. So... Like as a player, you're automatically thinking like, "Oh, they're going to say it to me," and just for him to like come in the first thing and like straight away, as soon like a couple of days, I think it was like the day after he was like announced his manager, he like phoned me and said, "Like, oh, I want you to stay." Like, blah blah blah. But, like, as a from my art, like player's point of view, that's like the most important thing. Yeah. But for me, anyway, like just to know you're wanted and like a new manager comes in. That's an any new manager comes in. It's like straight away. It's like an audition to see if you're his type of player because it's happened to me before like when I was in Germany a new manager came in and the manager just doesn't like you yeah. and there's just nothing you can do at the end of the day he's, that's the decisions he makes he likes different types of players and just for the gaffer to come in and say that to me right away it was like just straight away you're looking forward to next season and it sort of helps you move on from getting relegated and then when you come in the pre-season you see like other players are staying it sort of gives you even more confidence that we're keeping these good players and it lets you sort of go into this season confident and believing that we're going to go back up straight away. 100%. I think very early on in the season, obviously, we have the 6-2 game against Dundee and then we have a tough game away at our both, but we keep kind of grinding out the results. There was, I, I vividly remember someone tweeting on that a both game, you missed a chance that just kind of flashed across you and then about five minutes later, White and yeah. uh, chipped the keeper. I remember someone saying, I swear boys should be the one doing that and White yeah. should be the one missing. How did you deal with kind of, as we said, the expectation at heart is so much. So if one player has a bad game at heart, it's immediately just toys at the pram, right? We need a massive kind of overhaul. How did you deal with any form of criticism that you had in early seasons, both here and did you kind of take experiences at other clubs to help you deal with that? Yeah, uh, definitely like... Like I've been lucky, like the way it's went. Like obviously, Hearts is probably like the, is the biggest club with like the most fans, and that's obviously we're going to get more criticism, criticism and stuff. But like the sort of the clubs have been going to, like when I started my career at Ross County, you still get some of it, but not as much. And like because you're at a young age, like because there's not that much you can sort of like put it the the back of your mind and just get on with things. It's like everyone, there's always players are always going to have a bad game. Like here and there, like not robots or not like Ronaldo or Messi who's going to score every yeah. single match. That's just the way it is. And like when you're young, it's sort of hard to accept that. Obviously, everyone wants to do well, but like when you get it, thankfully I'm, I'm a bit older and I've went through that when I've came here. And I think like I probably did deserve a bit of stick at the start of last season because I was getting more chances than I thought. And I, like when I look back, I probably could have easily scored 20. And like at the start of the season, I was missing a couple of chances, but. Thankfully, like you just keep your head down, and like younger players will learn that. Some people already do, but like because I'm older, you sort of know there's always going to be people that either like you or don't. It's just you need you need to have your own reasons for wanting to do, wanting to do your best and wanting to score goals and wanting to win things. One hundred percent. And one of the biggest goals that you scored last season was, of course, at Hamden. Um, it was kind of the biggest high in terms of an individual game. Hibs had gone into that game having far more experience in terms of game time. We had started, I think it was literally like weeks before we'd only played a couple of games. Yeah. Um, how did you manage, as it, both yourself and as a team, how did you go into that mindset? Because obviously it's not just, oh, we're playing a premiership side in a semi-final. 
it's it's a derby in a semi final, but of course there's no fans there as, as well to contend yeah. with. So it's a really unique situation. How did you guys deal with that? It was weird, like being at Hamden with like no fans, because even when it's like sort of full, the fans are like a wee bit further away, and uh, even that's a bit weird on its own. Yeah. But, like when you look and there's like twenty meters, and then there's like massive stadium and nobody in it. It's like so weird, but I think. Like me, I was in that game, like thinking, like looking at our team and our starting 11, like thinking we're all like good enough to be playing in the Premiership. So I wasn't really looking at it as us against the Premiership team. Obviously, you just see it as Hibs, and we knew it was going to be a massive match. But I thought we'd done, we played really well at the start. And then obviously, Hibs got the, I think it was, what do you call him, Deutsch, scored yeah. ahead of him at the yeah. end. And then they obviously missed a penalty. And I think I had, I had a chance. I don't know whether it was in the 90 minutes or after. It was like Nezzy played me through. Yeah. I think Nezzy was massive in that game, actually. He came yeah. on and like sort of calmed everyone down. It was sort of like like wobbling a wee bit, but I think they just scored. And then he was like, his experience like, to help us get through it and like talking to everyone and he was making good passes and stuff. And he played me through and it was a massive chance and I missed. And then I think, I, I don't know whether it was in the first half or extra time or the end of the game, but whatever the... Like split was like it was like Sandy called like uh, old like old was a goal, and then just thankfully, obviously it's a bit of luck where they missed a penalty, and then obviously I got my chance and thankfully I took it. Well, Old Castle Rock asked that specifically about the goal. What do you feel was better in terms of your time at Hearts? That goal in terms of its importance, or your debut goal against Rangers with the crowd and just all the emotion of it? Um. The most enjoyable one was the one to score against Hibs, but I think like the one that helped me the most is probably the one against Rangers, just because like like as a new signing coming in, everyone's yeah. expecting of you. That's probably helped me the most, like because like if you come and you don't score for a couple of games, like people start like murmuring and stuff and saying yeah. we shouldn't have signed them. But my, 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 my most favourite one would be the one against Hibs, but that the Rangers one probably helped me the most. That's a really good answer. Folk will like that, that you've said that. <laughs> um, obviously, that then got us to the Celtic Cup final. What will go down recently is, in terms of the media as well, what they're saying, one of the most mental cup finals in yeah. recent years. Um, obviously, we go back and forward. I think many Hearts fans at halftime thought, right, that's it. We're 2-0 down. And then just the way you guys came out the second half and kind of from the 45th minute all the way through, we were the better side. Um the big question that a lot of people were asking, I've put Gordon Stitt down, but kind of this was a very popular one, was obviously you had to go off, unfortunately. Yeah. And many people would assume, just because especially with the way that you've taken penalties the first this season, you would have been taking a penalty. Do you feel that that would have impacted it? Or do you just feel it's one of those situations where, listen, I wasn't involved. It's down to those five guys who took them. Yeah, 100%. That's the thing that I didn't like... Them, like still think about it a bit when like, people talk about their cup final like when I went off I think it was two each again yeah and we were sort of like all over them and when they got I wanted to stay on obviously I, like I thought I was playing well just scored and then my hamstring was sore it wasn't like it popped or anything but mm-hmm. I think it happened a couple of times just before where it was like it was like a sort of spasm and then it would be sore for like three days and it'd be alright and then but it was just like the worry because it was like the league was like massive. Yeah, I didn't want to like rip tear my hamstring and be out for like two months or whatever. And I just had to say like I felt it a wee bit. And then the best thing was to take me off. But that's like if that hadn't happened, that's what I always think. If that hadn't happened, I was doing well. Like what would have happened? But I right, when it comes to penalties, like I've been involved in it before. Like I've missed penalties myself. Like I missed two. Like a retake against Alwa. It's like. <laughs> And then I had to hit one for an Northern Ireland without taking it, like having a yeah, touch. Course, so yeah. like the difference, like I don't think people I say realize the pressure's on you when you're in that situation. Like the stuff is going through your mind, and like the main games, it just sort of comes down to that one kick. And like, obviously, I would have, lo- I would have took one hundred percent. I'd love to take one, but it's just the way it is. That's the way penalties go, and like there's always going to be someone that. Like either saves a penalty or misses, and unlucky. Like unfortunately, that night it was us. Definitely, and then obviously the kind of next months followed with the harsh run that we had, where the form just kind of dipped. Obviously, we were still 
getting results, but it kind of culminated with that week that has been referred to in Hearts fans. Obviously, the Brora Rangers loss, and then a few days later, the Queen of South loss. We've obviously heard a lot from Robbie and individual players and stuff like that, but just generally, what was the reaction in the dressing room as a whole? Because, as you said, you'll have known the reaction online, you'll have known the reaction from the media, yeah. pundits and stuff like that. How did you guys just genuinely mentally deal with that and go, no, this season isn't done, we need to pick ourselves back up and we have the confidence in ourselves to keep going? Yeah, I think like, like our staff was like massive in that. Like, we knew we were all like in shock sort of when we came in. We knew we hadn't played well and like it's sort of in them cup games, like Brewer, to be fair to him, the way they defended sort of towards the end, we were like putting balls in and they were just blocking everything and like that's just the way it is in cup ties. Like, yeah, they sort of like try not try even harder, but like it's a, a bit more on the line. Like it's a big game. Yeah, and just sort of block everything. But when we came in, we were sort of shocked, and like our staff were like saying this, like this will be remembered. Like, so we like, sort of use it, like try and flip it and use it as like motivation. So like even in like cup games this year, we'd be like saying this. So I remember what happened. Like at the, in the Premier Cup, we were saying like remember what happened to Brewer. Like doesn't matter who we're playing against, we need to be on it. So we can sort of like go down in the dumps and lose confidence and stuff like that. So we sort of decided to use it and remember the feeling that you have when something like that happens to you and it should never have happened. Just make sure it doesn't happen again. And that's sort of what happened from then on. And then obviously against Queen of the South. I think it was, was it, I think it was 1-0 one, one and then we went 2-1 up. Yes. Yeah, we did. And then it was an own goal at the end, wasn't it? Yeah, Irvin scored an own goal. In a free yeah. cone goal as well. He went to clear it and it hit off the other side yeah. of his boot. And then, obviously, it's just like throwing salt in the winds, but it sort of helps you. Like, I think I've done it in an interview recently, actually, in Ireland. Like, they asked me about it the same, like, the season, and I was just like, it's like stuff like that, like a week like that, to show that we can come back from it and like finish the season strong and get, I don't know whether it was five or six clean sheets in a row and win every game and, even though we're champions and like most teams could like just settle down and take a like take a rest over the last couple of games, but we won every game, kept clean sheets and just to come through like a period like that it does show a bit of character and if it hopefully it doesn't happen again, but more than like like in football at all like you always go through a bad spell, but just to show that the our squad we can go through that and come out the other end of it better, then it's only a positive. 100%. So, that, as you said, we then actually finished the season very strongly. That coincided with players like John Souter, Peter Herring coming back into the first team, and Shea Logan as well, who came in for that short five games. We ended up winning by 12 points. What are kind of your overall thoughts in the season in terms of did you as yourself meet your targets? I know you always speak about how you set yourself 10 goals as a target. Yeah. And then you uh, obviously you surpassed that. Uh, the stat actually, I think I told you about this when it happened, was that your stats for this season were 25 games, 14 goals and seven assists, which is the most goal involvement in a single season since Rudy Scatchel and Paul Hartley in the 05-06 season. So, I don't know. I can't remember. I think I've seen it. I think you told me when it came out. Yeah. I don't so it's, that's a pretty good stat to have in general. Yeah, like I... It's weird, like when sort of, like I was a bit disappointed at the start, and then when I was like I was getting chances to score more and I wasn't taking them, and then sort of as came into a good runner form, I think it was like the middle of it, mm-hmm. and I just kept going and going, but like when I look back, I don't think, and like I played like my best that I could have, I think like obviously everyone always wants more like yeah. from themselves, but I was I thought I'd done all right like. And football in terms, like playing with the team and doing the stuff for the team, but like the, the goal scoring, I, I think I probably could have done better, especially more towards the start of the season. I probably should have had a couple more goals. And like if you had offered me the end stats before, obviously I would have taken. But it would have been nice to get twenty, even though it was a shorter season. It would have been like a very good achievement. It would have been a brilliant season. That's a good point you made there. Actually, I, I wanted to raise that because I think a lot of Hearts fans were quite just ignorant of your general play because when you were at Ross County, it was just, all oh, your Boyce is scoring. Next week, all oh, your Boyce is scored too. He's just constantly scoring. And I think it kind of became a perception that that was all there was to your game, where you were just like a poacher, a goal scorer. Yeah. But what this, what your entire time with us has shown is your all-round play is huge. Like, you've been played up front, can yourself, you played the partner, you've played in the 10. I swear against Inverness the other day, you were playing like yeah. centre mid. Yeah. <laughs> like, 
he seems to be able to do everything. And has that always been a part of your game, do you feel? Or is it as you've gotten older, you've kind of adapted your game? No, I think like I was always like, believe it or not, like in Ireland, I was the one, like I used to play up front with Joe Gormley. Mm-hmm. He, like, and he went to Peterborough and stuff. He's back in Ireland now. Like I was always the one to like be dropping deep and going and getting the ball and he would be the poacher. So like, I think it sort of started changing because like when I went to full-time football, obviously, like Ross County had Billy Dodds and Jim McIntyre's my managers up there. And like they were always about us getting in the box and having two strikers in the box and like our movement in the box. And I think that's sort of, like, because everyone sort of looks towards goals. And, like, I was thinking, like, because I came back from Germany and I thought, like, I wasn't going to play full-time football. And then when I went this time, I was like, right, everyone, like, thinks about, especially playing at Ross County, there's not a lot of games on TV or whatever. They're always just going to check the score sheet, see who scored. And that's, that's that, basically. So it was like, I need to sacrifice a bit of what I used to do and, like, try and, always be in the right position because the amount of goals you score like top ones where people shoot and stuff is like I'd rather score 20 of them a season than score 10 like where you skin about five people so I sort of went the opposite way I used to play more and I've learned that like I need to score goals basically I'm the striker like I need to be the one scoring goals so I've done that more than anything in my career I went from the opposite way like I've started to learn how to score more goals that's really interesting because especially when we move into this current season and obviously we are recording this the day before the Celtic game. It's going out yeah. after. So basically the reason I've not asked you about your hat trick that you've scored is that it's not happened yet. So just oh. you've, got to, you've got to do that. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> but how has pre-season been compared to last season? Because I saw Andy Halliday was in the press and he was saying that it's felt kind of more cohesive because restrictions have been easing. You all went away to Largs. Um, we've seen all the videos of you doing the kind of in the East Lothian climbing and water stuff. Oh, like, yeah. It seems like there's a lot more involvement. And I think that is just dirty restrictions. Not saying that previously yeah. all hated each other. It's just that you're now able to be with each other more. I think it was even that it's more like normal as well that like the length of preseason, because like obviously mm-hmm. last year would been off I don't know how many months it was it was like joined on to the summer obviously and went yeah. even longer so we had to like you had to like start running on your own you know like in the road just to get built up to pre-season because they've been off for such a long time so it sort of like dragged it all out and by the time like obviously I don't know if you didn't know any football or to like really enjoy pre-season it's running like it's is what it is we all know we need to do it and it gets you ready but like when it's like dragged out that long it's sort of gets born and you're just running and running and running. And then this year you come in and we knew it was what, like a couple of weeks before we were playing games. Mm-hmm. So like it's easier to put in the hard work and get all the yeah. right things out of it when you know it's not getting dragged out. So we're all doing it. And to be fair, all the boys come back like proper flan fit. Like like our results from like the test and the year before everyone was better and stuff. So and then when it, the games start like the preseason, you know, the preseason friendlies even, you know, when they start like the running's not going to be as tough and you're getting back to football, you haven't played football in a couple of weeks and you're like a kid again or like getting back on the pitch. So I think it's been, that's probably been the biggest thing that it's like a, actually back to like a normal line pre-season and not being like dragged out. And we can go and like the water sports thing was like brilliant, especially for like new players. Yeah. Like obviously when I came, like I was lucky enough to know like Michael and Connor and stuff and I knew like a couple of the other boys from playing against them. And like people come from England and all that don't, yeah. Or like big Armand and stuff coming from France, and you get to go out and just have a laugh. Like you're doing stuff together as like a team, and they're like you don't be shy or anything because you're just in with everyone, like having a laugh, and people are making easy to themselves, like claiming and stuff. It just sort of makes it easier to get to know people. One hundred percent, and it's kind of shown because preseason's been really successful, including the Premier Sport. I keep going to call it the Betfred Cup. It's not it's yeah. the Premier Sports Cup. Um, four games, four wins, eight goals, none conceded you kind of can't ask for more. You yourself have played four, three goals and one assist. Yeah. It's going really well. Yeah, definitely. Like it was sort of like interesting to see, like obviously we've been practicing like a formation and stuff, mm-hmm. like pre-season friendly games. It's like, there's like so weird, like it's like a training game or like no matter what team you play, it's sort of like the start of last season. Like when we played Dundee, like all teams, like think they can like, like their formations and try and play and, when it's in a pre-season friendly, there's like not as much pressure, like you're not losing anything. So 
it will be played like at a different pace. Like it'll be passing it about the back the way it probably wouldn't happen on a competitive game. And when we were playing like our two different like our couple of different formations, it was just interesting to see what way it work in a competitive game. And as you said, like we've got four clean sheets and we've been scoring goals. And we probably should have scored more in every game, to be honest with you, especially Saturday. The Inverness keeper or Sunday, sorry, wasn't it? The Inverness keeper was a, a joke, like they meant to say is at Ridgers. But yeah, it's just good to see it working in a competitive game and we all know what we're doing and hopefully we can only get better with it. So you mentioned the new formation. It's kind of what we've all been caught is like a 3-4-3. It seems one of the kind of criticisms last season was that perhaps at times it was a bit too defensive, whereas this is, and especially in the way you've been playing, it's really attacking. It's really based on getting the ball quickly and moving it out wide and then getting it to you. How do you feel in that system? Because now... You've got Guy McKay Stephen, who has really been hitting form. Uh, Josh Janelli is obviously back from his injury. It seems that especially you as a front three just seem to have immediately clicked and they're working really well in the system. Yeah, I think it's like it does suit us with our, like, our, the players we have. Like, obviously, Big Soapy coming back was massive. Like, he's good on the ball and stuff. And then even if Kingsley's playing like left centre half, you can tell like, he's a fullback. He's obviously like, more physical and stuff yeah. and he's he's still got like a full back ability on the ball and Hawks as well has been brilliant like sitting in amongst them but I think it's sort of getting people in the right positions where we know they're all good at and what they want to be doing sort of yeah. and then like as a front three obviously we didn't get to play with Gino as much last year mm-hmm. but I'm like really close to him off the of pitch like he's probably the one I'm probably most closest to out of the team and like sort of like the connections are and then just from playing with us like he sort of like thinks the same way uh, like mm-hmm. he's always like trying something and I just know he's just sort of know, like over time you know what he's going to try like like it's a bit more creative or something or like he'll do like tricks and flicks and you know when he's going to cross it and you know if he's like the goal against the Sterling yeah like I just made the run and I knew he was going to get it to me some way and he's like obviously crossed through the guy's legs I didn't know it was going to be that way but you just sort of make a run and that's just comes from time. And just for the like the formation to have them two that close to me, it just makes it a lot easier for me. Like if I'm under any pressure, it's just an easy well, you said now, but it's just an easy like touch and let it off. Yeah. And then I can just make a run and get in the box and knowing that they're gonna make something happen and the ball eventually will come in. I want to briefly touch on Janelli because I would get crucified if I didn't touch on Janelli. <laughs> He's only, I think he's only played 15 competitive games. I think that's yeah. the actual amount. But he has been taken to by the fan base in such a way that I've never really seen for ages. Why do you yeah. think that is? Is it he always comes across to us from the outside perspective as just being so engaged with everything? He re- just really seems to care despite being here for such a short amount of time. It also helps that he's been fantastic since coming yeah. in. But just everything, and there's that video, I don't know if you saw it, where during the game on uh, TV, it cuts to the fans singing the heart song and he just yeah. looks about like yeah. almost confused, but yeah. just happy with it. And it's stuff like that that we all love. Is he like that? You say that you're really close with him. Is he actually like that? Or is that just a perception that we've tried to create and go, no, we like him because he's ours kind of thing? No, like he's, that's about, like everyone in our chase room, like absolutely loves him. Like he's, like he's, a bit sort of mixed everything he's like the nicest guy he'll remember everything about everyone like he'll ask me about like my kids and how my mm-hmm. missus is doing he'll know about like stuff from my missus family that I've told him but he'll remember like like I would have forgot this meeting if you hadn't told me like a couple of days ago again that's I mean, just the way I am like my missus sort of reminds me about everything but he's one of these people that like if you told him your daughter's name he'd remember it in five months time whereas I would just say like oh how's your kids he would say like like how's Scout your daughter or whatever it's just the way it is, like, and it sort of like rubs people like the right way. Like, it sort of makes you like him even more. And then obviously the way he plays on a pitch, like, you know how sharp he is, and he's always trying things and he gets fans excited. So I think it would probably just be like a mixture of both. Like, he's like a really nice guy. Like, he would stop and talk to anyone in the street. He would do anything for anyone. And then when he gets on the pitch, that's the type of player you want to be watching. Like, stuff to try and make people to try and make stuff happen and get fans. Like off their sheets, so that's probably why the Hearts fans love him, and I can understand why. Well, you speak about fans there. In the last two home games, we've had fans back. Obviously, not 
full capacity, not anywhere close to full capacity, but how much of a help has that been? Even we we stupid things like that, singing the heart song and stuff like that, but just yeah. kind of generally getting behind you guys and having that atmosphere there. Yeah, it's been brilliant. Obviously, it's like been going well. And like I, I think even that, that I can remember when it was, I think it was about like the 60th minute or something. Mm-hmm. And like it was someone was down injured and it was like all quiet. Yeah. One guy started singing and I was just like, please, someone like, I think he sung like two lines at the start. Yeah. Like no one was joining. I was like, please, just someone sing with me. Like starting a slow clap. I was about to say, you should have started singing. I was. I, I always like mame it. I don't sing it obviously right now, but like just saying everyone joined in and it did sound like, it sounded like proper, like a full stadium, like because it was that loud and you hadn't heard it in so long. Obviously it would be louder if it was 20,000 people in, yeah. but just because you're not used to that noise, it was like, it was unreal just to hear it like live basically on, on the pitch. I think, um, someone kind of posted an image of Halkett as he walked out and he just looked delighted when he saw people. And there is that element of whilst people can be criticising performances from last season, from any football club, yeah. there is going to be that aspect of when fans are back, it it does just add that extra bit. It feels like a proper game instead of a pre-season friendly, as you said. Yeah, a million percent. Like even, who was it we played? I think it was then Lithgow. Mm-hmm. And there was like, I think it was like a couple of hundred fans even Something at it. Like that, yeah. It was just like even good, like warming up and like you're running past people and like talking to them, like saying like welcome back and all that there. And they're saying it to you, it's good to see you like out there. But it's just like stuff like that you miss because it's like if you're in big games and you can see fans and like people are coming and you're talking to them, it sort of like helps you like relax and calm down for games as well. And then when you come out, like before in the world, they calm you down and stuff. And then you come out and you hear the roar, you know, like it's time. Like, you know, you may be on it, it's time to go now. Like, this is, like, the most important thing. So, obviously, it is pressure, but, like, in football, it's always going to be there, no matter what, especially at Hearts. Like, if there's fans there or not, there's going to be pressure. But it's, like, more the support when the fans are there that helps you deal with it even better. Well, the season will be starting, as we're recording this, tomorrow we play Celtic at Tynecastle. Yeah. There will be, I think it's around 5,200 fans, obviously all Hearts fans. Are you looking forward to that? I saw, uh, I can't remember who you were speaking with, but you spoke about the fact that obviously it's Celtic. Like, yeah. I know they're going through a bit of dip of form just now, but it's still Celtic. You yeah. can't let yourselves get kind of overawed by the occasion. It just needs to be right. It's another side. We can get a result here. Yeah, we know how important it is. Like, it's our first game back and we've been playing well and we want to keep doing that. And we know it's a, a massive game, obviously. Like, people, like media will always say, like, if Celtic go to the Champions League, uh, it's terrible or it's a crisis, everything, all this mad stuff. But we know like they're good players. It just doesn't, it just means like one team is better than over a two leg thing. It doesn't mean anything. Like they've got a new manager. He's probably only starting to play the way he wants to play. They'll have new players. They're only getting used to it. So we know it's going to be tough. That Like you don't play for Celtic if you're not a good footballer, basically. And we know, we know what we're good at and we know We've been playing well and we're confident. We just have to stick to what we're doing and help each other through it. If anything makes a mistake, make sure we're out helping and to rectify it, basically. And we know it's a massive game and it's a good chance to get a, an unbelievable start. And that's the way we'll be looking at it. Well, I'll kind of close on this because it's the general question. I would ask you about your kind of target for the upcoming season. A lot of people ask Rab Armstrong and loads of people are like, what goal tally does he want? But I know that you always say 10 by Christmas and then you reevaluate. However, I just wanted to ask you because after the Sterling game, Robbie to Hearts TV said he has spoken to you and that he wants you to get 20. Are yeah. you kind of just keeping your like right 10 by Christmas and then I'll try and get a further 10? Or are you kind of in the back of your mind always going right 20s there on the horizon? Yeah, I think like as a striker, so always 20. Like even like, obviously the f- like freaks of football now have made it what, yeah. 50 goals a season. Like, but I think like even when you're younger, it's always like 20 goals a season. It's like like a brilliant season for a striker. That's always in the back of my mind. I just like to do the 10 thing because like like if you get the 10, just say you had an unreal season. Like I don't know, I think at Ross County where I had like 10 by I think it was like November or something. Mm-hmm. So then I look if I get the like ten by November, I'd be like, Oh, I said ten by December, I'll try and get a few more before then and then I'm on this. It's just I don't like live by it, like and if I didn't make it I'd be gutted, but it's just good to like if I get ten, just say you get ten by November and you score like 
four more before the end of December. Like, oh, I've got four extra and where I'm playing really well and sort of get your confidence up. That's always the way I thought. But like always in the back of your mind, I think 20 goals is what strikers really want. Well, I'm sure you're aware of this, but if you're not, in my lifetime, we've only ever had one striker get 20 goals. Yeah. And that was Robbo. Yeah. So I think Lafferty got 19. Lafferty has come the closest with 19. So yeah. if you get 20, you will, even if like we do nothing all season, <laughs> we'll remember your season. Yeah. So if you aim for that. I'd rather get 10 and win something. Hi, <laughs> that's it. In yeah. fairness, if you did, let's focus on that. Let's yeah. go with that. Um, massive thank you for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. And just good luck from us, a whole fan base, for both you individually and the team in general. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No Have worries. So massive, massive thank you to Liam for coming on, giving up his time. He literally came from training and messaged me going, <laughs> right, we'll do it now. Uh, massive thank you to the club, uh, Kat and Phil, for allowing that, getting it sorted. Hopefully it will be the first of many. We're really looking forward to it, but yeah. Huge thank you, Liam Boyce. Adam, you haven't listened to it yet, but so you are currently the only person at this point listening to it who hasn't listened to it, but I assume you give the exact same sentiments to Liam. No, very grateful for, for Boyce to come on. He's turning it into a right fan's favourite, isn't he? Um, so it's it's a massive coup for us. We're on about, seems to be a, a coup central today. Um, <laughs> but yeah, delighted to get Liam on. And hopefully that is the first of many. So massive thank you to everybody at Hearts. Um, and yeah, look forward to kind of more interviews in, in the future. Hopefully this is the, the first of many, like I say. Definitely. So we will now move on. We've got a couple of things. We're going to be introducing a new segment because it's a new season and I'm buzzing for that. And then we'll give the St. Mirren preview. But this new segment is, Adam, I'll be totally honest, what's the name of it again? I've forgotten. Around the Grounds. Around the, I was going to say Among the Grounds, which makes no sense at all. But basically, we're going to spend a couple of minutes every episode and looking at games that have happened in the week elsewhere and how it kind of pertains to us. So the start of the Premiership season started with Rangers at home against Livingston. They very comfortably won 3-0. Dundee, 10 men, Dundee, I think, as well. I think they went yep. out of 10. Drew uh, at home to St Mirren, uh, who obviously we play next. Ross County and St Johnston had the first 0-0 of the season. Love that. Absolutely. <laughs> Won't be the last. Exactly. <laughs> we, of course, beat Celtic 2-1. And then on Sunday, Aberdeen comfortably won 2-0 against Dundee United. Very much watching that 90 minutes kind of compounded why I think Dundee United are going to get relegated this season and then it ended with a very entertaining uh, 3-2 win for Hibs away at <laughs> Park. Exactly. Uh, and what that means is, is that the table after one game reads Rangers on the top, tied however with Aberdeen, Hibs and ourselves then from 5th through to 8th it's Dundee, St Mirren, Ross County and Johnston all on one point and then ninth Motherwell, 10th Celtic because of us, Dundee United 11th and 12th Livingston, but of course the, those bottom four are all sharing zero points. Was there anything, Adam, that really stuck out to you over this weekend? Um, well, I, I mean, I'm not sure how many Jambos keep track of my who scored previews, but I did have Rangers to win 3-0. So, you know, the first match of the Premiership season to have got that bang on, I just felt like retiring there and then, to be honest. Um, I had... Uh, St Johnston to win one 0 up in Dingwall, which Ali McCann obviously missed his penalty, so that could have been the case, but that's rather disappointing. I also had one each in the Heart Celtic, which, let's be frank, I'm delighted that Sophie <laughs> has then put an end to that prediction coming to fruition. Um, you mentioned Dundee United's lackluster performance at Pataudry. I predicted them to struggle, but not as much as I did for Livingston, and that 90 minutes at Ibrox. My God. I mean, I, I watched it in the boozer, obviously, in the build-up to our game. Um, I don't know whether you caught any of it, but I, Rangers... I it as well. I mean, Rangers hardly set the header alight, and it still just looked so easy. Like, I, I didn't feel as though they had to get out of first, second gear. Um, and Hibs was very disappointing, obviously, having gone behind twice, but hey-ho. It's, to be fair, that Motherwell-Hibs fixture, that's... That's a very underrated Scottish yes. football fixture. Like that always seems to bring goals. Everybody harps on about the six each, but 
yeah, that that looked a, a real cracker and probably a selling point for the Scottish game, to be honest. And that's all the Hibs praise that they're going to get from me uh, for this episode. So yeah, what, what can I say? It was a it was a great start actually to the the Scottish Premiership season. To be honest, I'm I'm chuffed that obviously Hearts are in it. That goes without saying, but chuffed that it's back. It's uh, it's it's been decent with the Euros and that, but there's nothing like you know the real football, the domestic stuff. Exactly. It was a very entertaining weekend. Sometimes you get first weekends back and they're a wee bit drab. You'll have a couple of games that are entertaining. But every game delivered, basically, apart from Ross County St Johnston. And then, even if you go a wee bit further down, there was the four-all mental case with Wraith and Hamilton where 23 minutes left to go, Wraith are 4-0 up. And it obviously gets dragged back to four-all. It was 3-2 in the Partick Thistle game. Like, Really, and it was just like Scottish football's back. There was all that part where Edinburgh City and Albion Rovers, where the ref got hurt and they had to have <laughs> players running the line. And and talking about the championship, Greenock Morton Dunfermline seems to be the least entertaining fixture <laughs> in Scottish football history. And yet, even that ground out a two each draw rather than the bog yeah. standard nil nil that we've become accustomed to seeing. So, no, it's it's fantastic. It's just brilliant. Um, and I think there's a few noteworthy talking points within every division never mind solely the Premiership 100% but we will now move our sights to this weekend's game we play St Mirren and Paisley obviously the last time we were there was one of the lowest nights in our lives as being a Hearts fans in terms of what it then went on to mean obviously Adam you haven't heard it but Boy speaks about that night and how they almost wish that they knew what it meant because they perhaps would have played a wee bit better yeah, but obviously we'll never know about Hot that. Take. Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> however, yes, Dundee did get a two-all draw against St Mirren. Of course, Dundee were at home, St Mirren were away. Um, and both times, though, St Mirren went ahead and Dundee managed to drag it back. We are obviously coming off the bigger result, the better result, but we are famously, particularly in our lives, and to be honest, in most hearts' lives, Terrible at what was Love Street. Like, how, how do you see this one going? Um, I mean, I'm not sure if St Mirren are offering kind of a pay per view, but given my track record for going to Paisley and watching Hearts, I'm definitely not tuning in in the hope that some like reverse psychology means that we'll come out with three points. And um, because it's like you say, a, not a happy hunting ground for us whatsoever. I think the last win. My memory serves me. It was en route to winning the cup in 2012. 12, yep. So not not even a league game. Mm-hmm. It must be over a decade now when when we last beat St Mirren in a league match in Paisley, which for a club of our size and stature isn't good enough. Um, obviously caught the highlights on sports scene um, with them against Dundee. I think that Curtis Main and Eamon Brophy look to be striking up a really good partnership. Obviously the first goal. Main's influential in the flick on to Brophy, who we know is a talented footballer. He's now off the mark for St Mirren, so that's worrying. Um, Jamie McGrath, who I've got in my fantasy team from the spot, good midfield player. Hopefully they'll lose him by the time the weekend comes around, Um, because I think Rotherham are interested or something like that. Um, So definitely a a few threats to be wary of. Um, And hopefully it's not typical hearts in that... You know, it's all now about the weekend. Yes, the win over Celtic was fantastic and we'll be, you know, um, reveling in it for quite some time yet. But it's all about Paisley at the weekend for me now. And if we were to start with two wins out of two, that'd be great. I don't want to say that I'd settle for a point, but had you offered me four points from the opening two games, I'd have snapped your hand off for that. So hopefully we're starting to build a wee bit of momentum and can carry the Celtic win into what is a massive game come the weekend. Because one of only two Saturday fixtures as well, everybody else yes. seems to be in Europe midweek, mm-hmm. um, and there's four games on the Sunday. So it's going to be interesting. A bit of a bizarre weekend, having had the first one so brilliant. Definitely. Um, I think a big aspect of this is going to be on the fans. Robbie himself said that um, he doesn't know if we would have got that winner if it had been last season because he very much felt that fans really helped. I haven't actually seen because of the whole way that everyone's going. I don't know if we've got if away fans are allowed. I don't think so. I think I thought I saw that on Twitter earlier where I think 
St Mirren are having to do a ballot as well because of right. season ticket holders. I think all clubs in Scotland realistically are in that kind of same bracket where they're not going to allow every se- single season ticket holder to come to every game. Yeah. So it probably is just going to be ballots for the meantime. Um, and I think that's no different. I'm, I mean, I don't know how Motherwell can host Hibs fans, yeah. but St Mirren can't host us. And I know that it's, I mean, it's through West, but it's hardly like it's, you know, other ends of the country. Mm-hmm. I don't see why it has to be any different. But The point being, however, is that we're not going to have fans to help us get through it and St Mirren will. So there will be that aspect of it where hopefully Benny isn't shaking at 2,000 St Mirren <laughs> fans. Um, the important thing for me is just that we keep this 3-4-3, we don't revert back to a 4-2-3-1. And I'd like to see us try and kill the game off pretty early. Like, what I mean by that is I don't care if we don't score until the 80th minute, but I'd like to just see us going for it. I don't want us sitting in. I know we're away from home and I know our record's awful there, but we should be able to take the result that we just got in a game that most people, even with Celtic playing badly and us coming in unbeaten and stuff like that, most people didn't give us a chance. We didn't really. You you were optimistic with a draw. I was quietly, quietly confident, but I just thought as though it would be an opportunity. You know, we've supported Hearts for 20 plus years. We know that that's the type of opportunity that we, we would always pass up. So I'm just delighted that that wasn't the case come the weekend. Exactly. And I really hope it doesn't, because if we get beat by St Mirren, it's almost like, what was the point in beating Celtic? Like, fully, fully agree three points after two games, when you look at the front two, you would go, okay, so we've been beat by Celtic and beat yeah, St Mirren. That, that's what you'd naturally think. Yeah, so it, re- it will be really disappointing if it's the reverse. But listen, I, I think we can go there and get something. Would you keep the same team? Obviously, Benny has just played 90 minutes, but he said himself in that interview, he was out on his feet in the last few minutes. He will have, of course, this week to kind of heal up, rest and train. Would you just keep going with it or would you make any changes at all? No, I don't, I don't, I don't see why we should make any alterations, to be honest. I, I think we've mentioned it numerous times last season as well. We're, it's so hard to sort of fault over something that isn't broken. I'm, I'm not a fan of changing a winning team, to be honest. I feel as though we've got to build some consistency. And ultimately, we've touched on it numerous times as well. If Benny's to learn the system, then chucking that, you know, setup out the window after one game, you know, what's the point? I, I don't, he has to learn how we're going to play. And ultimately, that's by sticking to this formation, sticking to personnel and just hoping that we can keep momentum gathering. 100%. I could not agree more. Can I get a score prediction from you? Oh, um, I'm going to have one in my heart and one in my head because I've got to remain impartial for who scored as well. But then this is the thing. Our record's not great, so I'm probably going to say that we'll draw one each, but I feel as though we can win it. And oh, I'll say one each, but hope that we nick it 2-1. Oh, oh. I always hope we batter them, but my semi-realistic, <laughs> exactly. my semi-realistic prediction is that we we win two one. I you? like the idea that you're sat as we're five now up going. I didn't want this. I wanted a quick <laughs> just nick two one for God's sake. Um, Where's this last minute winner? <laughs> exactly. Almost to be the reverse of you in terms of you saying that whenever you watch we do rubbish. Most of the times I don't watch the St Mirren games and we get beat. So, if there is a pay-per-view, I'll be watching and hope to break that duck. Um, you can give me feedback. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to go with a 2-1 win. I think we'll like concede. It. I think we will concede. But I just think if we play this system, obviously it is dependent on this. If we revert back to 4 2 3, one, ignore this 2-1 prediction. But <laughs> if we play the 3-4-3 uh, the three, three, without making any wholesale changes, I really do think we've got a chance of winning. We've got to, got to. Hope so. But yes, thank you for joining us on this 50th episode. I had three people, by the way, I put up two there, three, going, I oh, really look forward to your 50th anniversary. That's next week. The 50th episode isn't the 50th anniversary. You're, the day you're born isn't your first birthday. Like, it's the 50th episode. But massive thank you to everyone listening. Thank you to Liam Boyce for coming on again. 
really enjoy this chat and we all hope that you did as well. But just generally, to take a slight moment here, thank you for all the support across 50 episodes. Like, we would be doing this regardless. We just like speaking about hearts. It genuinely, though, makes it so much better that we have so many people interacting, so many people listening. And I don't mean that from the perspective of, look at us, we have these numbers and stuff like that. That's not what I mean. I mean just that whenever we share an opinion, we get people going, I think you're spot on or I think you're miles off it. That's always more engaging, more entertaining because it allows us to hopefully deliver a show that you guys enjoy listening to. It's just been far more success than I could have ever imagined. Adam, I'm assuming you're the same. You obviously founded this. You came up with the initial idea. You brought it to me. How have you felt about the first 50 episodes? No, it's been brilliant, mate. Honestly, it's one of the highlights of my week. And um, you've mentioned, obviously, the, the interaction with listeners. I love, you know, responses to everything. I love folk digging us out, folk in agreement. And we've built up a really loyal listenership. And I cannot thank them enough because... They make it all worthwhile, and it's just an absolute blast. I, I love recording these, love when it's put out, love getting folks' reactions from it, um, and hopefully that first 50 is is the start of a good few episodes to come. 100%. And hopefully now that we're getting back to Tyne Castle, we're getting into games more and more often, hopefully getting closer to full capacity, we'll be able to see people at games. Obviously, last week, Adam had his celebrity status very much certified as he was recognised. But just meeting up with people before the games, having a laugh, having a drink, having a chat, hopefully we can do that. But we have been Perth to Paisley. Thank you for listening. Please do share it around if you have enjoyed it. We are on Perth to Paisley at every single platform. It's all below me in the YouTube version. But if you are listening, we're Perth to Paisley on every single social media platform. We're also Perth to Paisley at gmail.com. The email's down there as well. Please, please, please leave a review, leave a rating, leave a like, subscribe. It really helps those stupid algorithms that gets out to more and more people. Adam, where can people get you on social media? You can get me on all the socials at Adam T. Kendo and yourself, mate. I'm at D. McIver 22. We will be back next week to speak about any potential incomings or outgoings to review the St. Mirren game and anything else. Once again, genuinely from both of us, thank you so much. And we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Mon the horse! That was different. <laughs>